the thought of giving in I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank When it's take a swim, only option is to win In the murky water, not a thought of giving in Welcome to the shrimp tank Want to put it all together, this is big things Doing big things, chasing big dreams Yeah, it's all real, this life's all that it seems All the chicks scream, all the dudes yell This is just what I do and I do it well With the flow fresher than the new shoe smell Going through hell, well homie keep going You know the same and you gon' reap what you sow in so, so I don't chase girls, I just chase dreams Play the same game, but we ain't in the same league Running a campaign, roadie 2016 Like a phone to die, put me in charge I'm a general from the front, I'ma lead the charge Like a federal fell on my lap, never Going hard as ever, the results match the effort Good afternoon, everybody If you ever want to learn about grants You are in for a surprise today We have the grant queen in the studio today And we are going to learn everything everything about grants so i am excited this is the oz digital studio where we partner with the fau adam center for entrepreneurship filming the shrimp tank podcast we interview the best and brightest entrepreneurs down here from south florida they've come from everywhere these days i mean entrepreneurship is exploding right now in south florida and all across the united states but specifically they're coming down to south florida Dr. Roland Kidwell is back in the shrimp tank today. Roland, how have you been and what is going on with entrepreneurship at FAU? I see all the cars in the parking lot and students attending a lot of events right now. School's in. School started. And uh, we're in our second week. And we're uh, having our classes and we're doing our thing. And last uh, Friday, uh, my colleague Dr. Cox and I put together our entry to or our survey on entrepreneurship, undergraduate and graduate, the Princeton Review. We were ranked 37 in undergrad, 41 in grad last year, this year. Next year we hope to be moving up a little bit there. And uh, we're also getting our grant application ready actually for Veterans Florida. This will be our seventh uh, consecutive year working with Veterans Florida, and we have to put together a grant application each year, and uh, we've been working on that. That's about to go out the door, so that's a little relevant to what we're talking about today. And everything else is going rather t- relatively smoothly, I suppose. Exciting times here at FAU. For we're sure. back, yes. We're having classes. We're, we're uh, in our classes. Started uh, last two weekends ago, actually, with a, I'm teaching a Ph.D. seminar in advanced management. That's kind of interesting. Way above my head. Yeah. Way well, above my head. What, yeah. do you, what, do, what, do, what do we learn in that type of environment? We're teaching people how to use evidence-based research to come up with their consulting. So basically when they come to a company and they uh, provide some advice, they can actually back it up with some uh, facts and some research, and that's where that's going. Yeah, I'm more go with the flow. When I hit a fork in the road, I make a decision left or right. So I'm, I've always been bad on that topic. You know, I think many entrepreneurs have, as as you've witnessed, right? Because most of them just go with their gut, their intuition. Well, yeah, they do, and some of them fail. So that's why we have our big They camp. sure yeah. do. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so we're trying to get that out, too, the business model canvas, and try to get them to examine their businesses and uh, see if there's a market, see if there's customers, you know, all that good stuff. What is the percentage of failures within the first year and five years these days? Have any numbers uh, been updated when it comes to I don't gen- know general businesses? I know restaurants have a higher number. Of course, certain tech scenarios like apps have the worst numbers. But like in general, what are the, the figures these well, days? Well, as you know, family business is where I come from. And probably about 30% go to the second generation for okay. a variety of – sometimes it's by choice that they don't. And then 10% to the third generation. So that's family businesses. And I would say probably that, that implies about a 70% uh, – uh, there and uh, probably similar to new businesses, but yep. you never can tell. You know, um, it depends on the industry a lot of times. Depends on the entrepreneur. Yeah, I did my first presentation at FAU yesterday. I was at the uh, American. What is it? The Marketing Association. Yeah, cool. It was quite cool to see thirty, forty students in a room picking my brain about marketing and my new project I'm working on called Owl. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a mobile app where we could, uh, of course, seek guidance from experts instantly. And it was really fun to, to give a presentation for a change, right? Everything, you know, last year and a half, there's the campus has been empty, right? And it's, you know, my first time giving a speech again. So it was quite fun, you know, doing it in person compared to Zoom, right? Everything the last year and a half has been Zoom. Well, you Zoom can give this, some Zoom speeches that. on Zoom. 
Yeah, you can, but it's <laughs> d- it's different seeing people's eyes right in front of you, yeah. you know, compared to on the screen, right? So, you know, but fun times at FAU. I'm excited to come back and do more, and hopefully numbers get better with COVID and, you know, things open more up, you know, and we can travel again. Well, let's get into our, our guest today. This is the podcast where we interview the best and brightest entrepreneurs. You catch all of our amazing episodes on iTunes, uh, iHeartRadio, Spotify, wherever you catch your podcast these days. And of course, on Facebook Live at Shrimp Tank Boca or on Instagram. We do clips every single Thursday at 4 p.m. So today we have Libby. Is it Hike Kind? Is Hikens. that how you pronounce it? Hike Kind. No, I got it wrong. <laughs> Everybody I got does. it wrong. Okay, so I'm not the only one. Okay. And she is the founder of Grant Watch. And I'm excited to learn more about Grant Watch and, and how other businesses locally can benefit you know from your services of course as well as it sounds like nonprofits and for profit is right. that correct it's right. both categories well we have grants for nonprofits grants for small businesses and some grants for individuals as well okay so tell us you know let's dive right in okay. tell us about you know your typical you know client slash customer and and how you help them you know of course get some funds well grant watch has grants for the entire united states uh, Israel, Canada, and international. So what you would do is you'd come to Grant Watch, you'd sign up, and then you'd be on our email list, and that's free. And when if you want to go and look for a grant and see all the details so you can apply, then you would subscribe because there's an, a subscription, which is really um, quite small. It's $18 a week, it's 45 a month, $90 a quarter or a 199 for the entire year we add new grants every single day so that's the thing we archive the grants when they come due and we add new grants and when you ask what's new at grant watch well there are seven i think 7111 currently available grants today on grant watch and we have about 26,000 grants in our database and that's really difficult to accomplish because every day grants get archived and so we're constantly restocking our shelves this is not something that you know is just dormant years ago you could buy a cd for a dollar and then somebody would approach you hey uh you know of course they want more money after that but that's not the way we are we just constantly add new grants we're re- researching we review them, we want to make sure that they're legitimate, and we put them up, and we uh, really change grant language into English so that anybody can use Grant Watch and understand what are the Now, is there a lot of competition in this space? Is there a lot of other websites that do something similar? Or are you guys the largest? Kind of, I'm not familiar you know, okay. with this industry. Well, when uh, we started, when we started in 2010, okay. May 2010, I took my first dollar, okay? Um, At that point, we had one or two major competitors and, of course, Grants Stock Up, which is a government agency uh, website, and they only put up federal grants. And our goal was to have a one-stop place where everybody could go and they could find federal, state, local, corporate, and foundation grants in one place. And I set my sights on a competitor, and we've surpassed them way, way beyond them. We are the closest uh, in the Alexa ranking to Grants.gov. So when a, a website gets so close that they can almost touch the government website, we've come a long Is way. Is that based on the number of grants you have or the number of dollars of the grants? How do you measure that? Well, Alexa um, is the website ranking um, website, and so you could see based on traffic stats. The traffic, okay, traffic, traffic. So Alexa lets you know the traffic, and just th- I think it was Monday, uh, we got really <laughs> so <laughs> close to Grants.gov. It was like, how did this happen? This is great, and we have systems in place to constantly move things along. When we talk about entrepreneurship, you have to do marketing. Right, And marketing doesn't have to necessarily be paying for marketing. You have to do things that bring people to your website. So uh, we do – do you want to hear this? I- oh, yeah, keep okay. going. Marketing <laughs> is the foundation of every business, right? It's, uh, one thing's the idea, but execution, you know, it always comes back to marketing, right? You right. got to okay, so always sell yourself. You always got to market yourself and your business. So 
Execution, when we're talking about online, of course, you have to make sure that you have a title tag, a meta description, keywords, all that great stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. And that's on every page of your website. But it can't be false. It has to be real. It has to be authentic. So how do we get there? Well, we add, first, first of all, we add new grants every day. So every grant gets its own page. So that right away gives us fresh content constantly. Besides that, we have Grant News on Grant Watch. And Grant News uh, is the newspaper. So every website needs to have a blog. I don't know why, but that's the way we were told when I started in 2011. Every website has to have a blog and has to have fresh content. So Grant News has the fresh content, and we add about two articles a day to Grant News. And that's all helping entrepreneurs and businesses. You know, if you're a, biz if you're a nonprofit, you are a business, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You're a business. You just take your funding in a different way. Right? So this is a pretty fun topic. I love SEO, and we don't get into SEO in fine details like we're about to do. And I want our audience to hear what, what – you know, SEO means when you're doing these blog articles, right? A lot of people think you build a really interesting website and then they will come, but that's not the case, right? You got to get backlinks. You have to, you know, reach out, you know, to, you know, Forbes.com, all these different places and then have articles written and then get back to your actual article that you're speaking of on your blog. So can you kind of explain kind of so the finer details have, okay. like of the articles, you know, do you go after a specific niche? Because someone's got to find it after they Google you guys, right? Right. But the... The thing about uh, content writing uh, is that you don't want to do this keyword stuffing in your, in your blog. You really want to write to your audience. And what you write has to really resonate with them and be of interest. So when you write an article and you mention something else, and there we go to best practices, right? When you go back and you have best practices of some... Uh, something or some research or whatever, you want to have an outside link. So you give someone else an outside link, but you use a quality outside link, right? Go back to the primary source as we teach students in college, right? So link there. Then you want to link within your website to a previous article or some resource that you have on the website. And, of course, you want to link back to your website where the people could pay or people could use it properly. So you have to have writing guidelines, but they have to be loose enough that they don't, you know, damper creativity. And if you look at Grant News, you can see that each of our authors, and they're, on, they're part of the business, each person has their own style of writing. And you'll, you'll see that one writer likes to write about grants that have been funded. Another writer likes to write more, it's a natural progression of where they started out and where they get to. And somehow we have to find a way to slip in the grants, but the article's so interesting. Um, Jake is with us and his articles really take you there. Uh, then you have another person in my, on my staff and she likes to write how to. And she'll do a little video. She'll give you some instructions. So did you have background in writing or did you learn this as an entrepreneur in like 2010, the business opened where you, were you, you know, right out of the gate starting to write articles on your blog or, oh, no. or <laughs> trying to get back links or it kind of just over time, it, you know, you came to a realization that this is a great marketing play because we'll get featured everywhere. And then eventually people will go on Google and then eventually land on your site. You know, of course, then traffic picks up and then people. Well, the novel thing about Grant Watch and why we really knocked it out of the park was because we cover so many physical areas, right? We have all the states, the territories, the provinces in Canada, um, Israel, international. Because we go there, I segmented the website. So if you are on if you're looking for grant in Florida, you want to be on florida.grantwatch.com. And if you're in New York, you want to be on newyork.grantwatch.com. And then we have categories. So if you type in Google Florida grants youth, you will find us on the first page. Arizona um, homeless grants will be on the first page. So we have a natural, organic way of doing our SEO. It, it just happens. Mm. But we have many different facets. I have social media going out on all the channels 
every single day. I have my staff sharing our social media so that then their friends and family and colleagues will also share it. Uh, we, as I said, we have two content articles every single day going out. Um, I'm just trying to think there was more. We do public relations. I'm here. Somebody contacted you, got us on the show, right? Of course. So I, I do a lot of that. Um, I'm looking at your page right now. Right. It's very clean. I see all the posts. This, this is pretty neat, unique stuff. Right. Absolutely. And then we have where we reach out. We want to know if somebody got a grant on Grant Watch. Mm -hmm. If they found a grant on Grant Watch and they got funded, we want to know. So I brought you something that's ahead of the game. So, Roland, I hope you get the grant because I gave you the latte mug, and that's what you get when you find a grant on Grant Watch. Ooh. And you get Whoa. funded. And you get well, funded. In, in advance, we got the right. mug. This is big. Well, you better go get your grant, too. <laughs> yes. I've already got my application <laughs> in. I, Tell me. Maybe, uh, maybe. Libby, talk about when you started this business and tell us how you got into this and what did you do? What was the first thing you did? How did you start this? Well, I was a public school teacher. And as I told you before we started, I was teaching uh, in a junior high, classes for mostly handicapped, way before anybody ever talked about Ritalin or Concerta or whatever any of these drugs are, right? And so they had 10 junior high students in my classroom with one paraprofessional. That's the way. And we were a special ed unit of classes like that. And they were giving out, um, there, was, there were exams, and New York City was expecting all special education children to take these exams. And, of course, the teachers were kind of rated, even though they didn't say that, how well the students did. So I had a challenge in front of me. And I never back down from a challenge. But th those students, if I corrected anything on their paper, would take the paper, crumple it up, and throw it at me. That's just the way it was. How are you touching my paper, right? It's like I invaded their space. So what was I going to do? I was reading everything. I was a young, fresh, brand-new teacher, constantly reading, trying to figure out what, what I could do. And I read about word processing. You know, I still had a, uh, a typewriter in my house, but I read about word processing. And I figured out that if I would teach my students to do word processing, they would then want to correct their work and learn to write. So that, that was my goal. And I went to my special ed supervisor. And oh, first I went to my principal. My principal said, well, Libby, we do have a computer room. And nobody's going to take your class. So if you want to go in there, you have to teach yourself computers because you have to be one step ahead of these students, which I did. I started teaching myself. I go in, and the computers don't do word processing. There was not enough memory. Old Tandy, the you're, Tandy Fours. You're talking in the 90s right now, correct? Oh, no, I'm talking the 80s. Oh, you didn't <laughs> Sorry. Right. okay. You remember, right? Floppy disk time, yeah. <laughs> oh, floppy disk? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was about yay big, like what, four and a half inches? The whole right thing. around when uh, you were born, Travis, right? <laughs> <laughs> right around then. Well, yes, sir. so what happened was I couldn't use the computer room. I, my special ed supervisor told me to make up a budget. I did a budget. He brings it to the school district. I was sure we were going to get money because they were throwing lots of money into special ed in those days. And the school district says, we don't have any money. Sorry, but there's a grant available. And if Libby wants to write the grant and apply... That's fine. We'll teach her. So free funding. Somebody's going to teach me something. I'm there. Okay. So I go after school every day. I have to get extra babysitters for my kids because, you know, I'm going after school. And I'm learning and learning and learning. And I take on this grant to Tandy Corporation, Radio Shack. And I win. Four in the United States were given out. It was the Model 100, which is the size of an iPad, with about, I don't know, six-inch screen possibly straight across, green, black, like that, I get $15,000 worth of Model 100s, one big Tandy Model 4, and a dot matrix printer. Okay, that's the paper with the edges oh, on the side. Yeah, Nobody yeah. knows what this is, right? Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. I feel like a lot of places still use those somehow. <laughs> a lot of the government places, I right. still see them printing. I'm like, how do you even get a printer like that? Okay, so now I'm going to teach my students word processing. They're going to print it out. They're going to go home with this and be thrilled because it's, they can do it over and over, print it out, correct it. Nobody's really ha nobody really has to destroy their work. 
And so that, that was the beginning. Mm. And then they handed me another grant, Commodore 64, for $9,000 matching. I got that. By the time I was done, I outfitted an entire computer room. And I was asked to leave special ed and become a mainstream teacher for business careers, computers, and entrepreneurship. Mm. Oh, look at that entrepreneurship mm. in okay. the blood from day one. And that right, and that's what I did. And they mainstreamed the special ed students into my classroom because I had the special ed background. So here I was in the junior high doing all this, and the school district says, Libby, we want you to come and work for us. And now I'm out of the classroom. Two years in the school district, $11 million raised for community school district 18. And then I went back in the classroom and I opened up my own grant writing business. Mm. So I was a grant writer mm. and I, uh, at that point, we still weren't really creating websites. I mean, the artwork was done, logo, uh, I think, it, what was it called? There was something, some art project that I was using, but nothing of any value. And so I was doing a fax newsletter to my clients of what grants were available because everybody wanted to stay being my client, but they wanted grants. And so that's what I did. And I continued to send out this newsletter for years and write grants. And then I retired. And when I retired in 2009 from teaching, after working for many, many years, I knew that the technology was available. I was playing with it in my head, but I was also doing oil painting and stained glass. It was my time to really chill. Well, it didn't take long, but I needed to be back doing something on a regular basis. And I started building, and it was NYC Grants Watch was mm. the beginning. We went to New York State and then Tri-State, moved straight across the United States, adding and adding and adding, and that's where we are today. Mm. Well, it's a great story. And you did not. You know, our audience, listen, a New York uh, City school teachers have amazing pensions. You have the tax deferred annuity, getting great, you know, return on uh, tax deferred money, of course. So it's interesting. A lot of teachers don't go d back down that road because you're you're sitting happy, right? How many years did you have in the pension system at that time? Twenty nine and a half. So you you still have that itch, you know, uh, of course. To I didn't. To, I honestly, I didn't need to work at yeah. that point. What happened, what really kind of motivated me was um, one of my ch children m moved and sub because they made the move, the husband's position changed and things didn't work, wasn't, things weren't working out financially for them. So I was helping out okay. as mothers do. I was helping out. And I said to myself, hmm. If you're going to keep doing this, this wonderful retirement that you planned is not going to happen because, you know, you're supporting another family. You're helping. And so I kept writing more grants, and I brought my, my daughter into the business, that, that, that daughter, and we were working together, and then I started to build. And, you know, necessity is the motherhood of invention. We, I needed it at that point. Um, now, thank God, everybody's fine financially. I your daughter's still with the business today? She's still with it. She, nice. she actually manages an entire team. Uh, of What we did was we set up a separate management company so that she is in charge of her division. So she can make all those decisions for her division, and I make for my division. And where is the division? Is your daughter down here in South Florida? Or my daughter in is in Israel. Oh, Israel. Interesting. And we have Americans that well, they're called expats, I guess, right? Yep. That are living there, and they are, have been educated here. They know the funding industry. They know the nonprofit world, and it's great. I have my staff here all across the United States. I'm involved in customer service. That's daily. Um, I'm involved in marketing, uh, public relations, content, so what's the what's the split up? Like how many people are working in Florida? How many in in Israel or in other locations? Well, in Israel, remote? it's not. There's an office uh, that she manages that has about six people in the office full time, and then there's another fourteen or fifteen people that work part time from home. Okay. And then we have, uh, but that she man. <laughs> oops, sorry. <laughs> she manages that segment. And I do mine, and so I have my people, and don't ask me how many because I didn't count <laughs> oh, before I came. Uh, ballpark, I would say we probably have about uh, 10 mm -hmm. here in the United States. 
Um, and then I have my de- a developer that I love that's okay. been with me that's um, overseas. Uh, so that's how we work. So who are your customers? Who signs up for this? Individuals, governments? Everything. I have sheriffs and mayors and senators and assembly people. Um, we have hospitals, colleges. Um, we have small nonprofits, large nonprofits, umbrella nonprofits. We have businesses of all kinds that will come in. We have got a large influx of businesses during COVID because the grants were given out for businesses. Years ago, finding a grant for a business was kind of hard, but there came the realization that the businesses are the backbone of the American economy, and yep. so everybody's trying to help them grow and stay and retrofit since COVID. So we have businesses, we have artists and musicians and um, uh, writers, So everything. let's play an example. You know, Roland Kidwell, he's the director at the, the FAU Adams Center for Entrepreneurship. He sets up a meeting with you. Where do you tell him to go? What direction, you know, with some of these grants? I take him to the, um, uh, I, why is it slipping my mind? I Institute for High, I-H-E, right? Am I right? I don't know that one. Oh. <laughs> no, is that not the acronym for colleges and universities? Institute for Higher Education. Education, right. Oh, no, grants. Travis, there we go. Right, the grants. So I take you to that category. Um or higher education, whatever, and we look for Florida and higher education, and that's that's what we look at, and we try to take a look and see if there's something that you are eligible for. So do you for. have a personalized service then, or people just, it, it's, it varies, like you go on the website and look for a grant and do it themselves, or they get you to write it for them? How does it work? So we have, Grant Watch itself is self-service. Right. Okay? You use Grant Watch. You have trouble, you call us, you can chat with us, you can email us. We'll help you. We'll give you some links. But reviewing the eligibility of a grant and all the details, that's on you. Because before you apply, you really need to know whether you're, app- whether you, uh, whether you're eligible. The next step is what happens if you don't have that staff. But in a university, you do. You don't need to hire a third party. But if you want to hire out, we have a button that says, I need a grant writer. Mm. And that will take you over to grant writer team. And there you put up a request for a grant writer. costs $50. We advertise it all over. And it goes on our social media. It goes out to all our grant writers. And it stays on the website. And the grant writers will bid on your project. Oh, wow. This is pretty unique. Okay. And the, you choose one grant writer from their bid. We don't give you their resume. We keep them anonymous. What we do is we let them write two paragraphs about why they should be chosen to write your grant. What is their background that relates to what you need? So they have to really earn this business, not like reviews, like five are you just like, okay, no, no. five-star review, that's the one, right? No, no they, you make them really think about make them think this ab- exact project. I like this. And then also when they sign up to be a grant writer, they create their grant writer profile. And in their grant writer profile, they have to put in three grants that were awarded and one page writing sample from each grant. So that's how you vet them. Right. So if they don't have that, we don't want them. They can put list up to five, but we only want three one-page writing samples, and they upload it right next to it. They tell us how much they won, and then they put in uh, two to three references, and they also have to list their experience and expertise, and all of this is anonymous. Now, is there a review section, though, Be like the, the let's say three people apply to that, that person's after they submit $50 where it says, well, here's all that information, but I have a five-star review, and this person has a four-star review. Does that get included too, or no? A no, what we do, no, what happens is you put up a request for a writer, and the grant writers that are available and want that project will bid on it. You choose from those three, four, five, ten, whatever you get, one person. That person then has your phone, name and phone number and will contact you and send you an email as well. You have a conversation, and if and. In that conversation, the grant writer will create a contract. We have a contract on the website that merges the two, and they then fill out, they then create deliverables, a set of deliverables for the project. Mm. So if you, like you say, I want somebody to research and find the grants for me, that would be the uh, deliverable would be to find five grants that are uh, for 
um, adult education. Let's say that's what it is. And when the deliverable is complete, they upload the, the material and you pay on the site. It's automatic, you pay on the site. So let me, let me backtrack a minute. The grant writers bid on the project. You choose one grant writer. You speak to that grant writer. If you don't like that grant writer, you call up and you go, Libby, it wasn't a match. I say, okay, pick your second grant writer. Sure. We clone the request. We let you pick your second grant writer. We don't let you pick your third, fourth, fifth. We don't want you to be part of that business. <laughs> of if you need to do that, you're just trying to build your yeah. own business. We don't want that. But when people are really honest and working with us, we want to help them. So now you have your, you have your grant writer. The grant writer is going to create the contract after talking to you, set it up. You then accept the contract as a, as a grant seeker, or you say, no, I'd like you to make changes. You can press okay. a button. You send it back to the grant writer. And how many grant writers are there on your site? They just keep coming and going. Oh, wow. So yeah. there's no, and they're all freelance. They're all freelance. freelance people. So they're basically, your contract as a grant seeker is with the grant writer. We're not quite the middleman. We're the matchmaker. Mm. And how many of these are done on a daily basis? We where? get in about two or three requests for a grant writer every day, and then they're filled. You know, it's, it's and there's there any other com like so you're you're getting all the subscriptions. I'm just trying to understand the model on from your side, right? So How I have well, I have four different corporations. Okay, so you got revenue coming in from subscriptions. You got revenue on the fifty dollars. Well, it's a different match. corporation. Okay. You cannot sign up when you sign up to Grant Watch. You signed up to Grant Watch. You want to use Grant ah. Writer Team? Sign up for Grant Writer Team. Grant writer team is not a subscription. It is for a grant writer. A grant writer that signs up pays a membership fee to be able to bid. But then there, and, and then there's a, a money flowing through your site. So I, Roland signs up. He gets he hires the grant writer, and then it's two thousand dollars. I'm assuming, right? Uh, as an example. So it, then, okay. So let's say the entire project was two thousand dollars. Let's let's say that the grant writer has to break that two thousand dollars up into a retainer and deliverables, so that each part. If the grant writer is writing your uh, organizational capacity, then if that's the way you want it broken up, you will then get that. It'll it, the grant writer will do it, upload it, and then after you pay, you'll get it. And then you want if you want the next deliverable to be revise it. However you want to do it, you, you want to break up the parts of the grant, you want to just do, uh, if it's a small grant, you want to do a draft and then a final, you break it up So the way. client then submits the grant to... The client work. should submit the grant. One of the things I've told my grant writer, especially since COVID, we have a lot of people that have never been in the funding space and they have to um, submit the grant for them because there are a lot of grants that are just a small one or two page are online now because of everything that changed. So if you're actually completing the application, you have to be able to submit. You can't just walk away from it. Right. I tell my grant writers and I tell my grant seekers, give the grant writer an email address. Okay. Give them a username and password. When the project is over, you take it back. It's yours so that the funder can communicate with you. You don't want the funder communicating with the grant writer. You don't want the grant writer putting in their name. You want your name in there. So that's how we work. And so they can do that. But along the way, if, the, if it's a two-pager, there's still text that has to be written. Even though it's check off this, check off that, you could be on the phone with, with the client getting the answers. But that text needs to be reviewed, needs to be submitted to the client, reviewed. So as the matchmaker, are you also taking any other type of fee? Right? Yes. It's $50 to match, but then there's $2,000, right, that hits the platform as an example. Okay, so, so what then... happens is we set it, I set it up this way. This is, understand, grant writer team I think is in business since uh, maybe September 2012. I think it's either 12 or 13. Over the years, many things have happened, and you have to be able to evolve and see yep. what's wrong with my business and, and what's going on. And I'm at the crux of that right now again, and I'll tell you about it. So over the years, we've, we realized that by letting the grant writers take this major retainer in the beginning, then the, some of them just walked away. Nobody could find them, didn't do the work, mm -hmm. and we were stuck. And if, if PayPal was very nice and we contacted them and they refunded the money, we were in good shape. But if not, we were stuck and we were left holding a bag. People said, but I met them on your site, right? So they were there. the was. matchmaker. Because yeah. I was the matchmaker. So we worked it out that 
the retainer, from the retainer, we get 80%. They get 20%. Ah, interesting. And from the, each deliverable, from deliverable 1 to 14, we get 20% and the grant writer gets 80%. So the grant writer wants to have a smaller retainer which is great. We, we're fine with that. We're not, I'm not, you know, we're not money grabbing kind of, uh, uh, we're not that kind of a business. Yep. We want a fair and honest business. So by doing this, the grant writer realizes I have to do my work in order to make any money. We also don't want them to lose the client for us, right? So they're not going to get, they're not getting paid till later down, um, down the road. And if they should walk away, we have 80% of it, we can return it. Yeah, right? that's very smart. You know, you so know, that it's, but it know. happens. An entrepreneur needs to know that you have to be able to move. You have to flow with the business. So I'm, say know. I'm taking a $100,000 grant. Right. What do you think it's going to cost me to go through that process? You see, so it doesn't depend on how much you're looking for. It depends on what's, how many hours it's going to take the grant writer to work. What and should I do, though, if I come in? Do you have any advice for me? I mean, how, uh, what My advice I? is write your first grant yourself. Unless it's so important to your organization that your organization could fall apart without that proposal, do, do the first one yourself. What happens? Your passion is going to be on the page. So here I am. I have a business grant writer team. I'm telling you, write the first grant yourself. Gather everything you need to write that grant. When you're going to work with the grant writer next time, you're not going to be wasting their time she, he or she's going to ask you, well, I need the lease. Uh, I need your um, IRS certification. I, I need your resumes. I need all these things. Where are they? And then you miss the deadline, right? So the first one, you write yourself. You gather everything together. I do something called PMF, Passion, Maps, and Folders. So Passion, write your first grant yourself. And, and if you are using a grant writer, make sure that grant writer relates to your cause. If they're not on board, you have a cookie-cutter proposal that's not going to get funded, right? But if they are and the passion jumps off the page, you might be forgiven for something because there's so much passion in it. Somebody's really jumping on your cause. And then you have folders. You need to have a hard copy folder and online folder because online we lose things. Things get written over. You want the documents, print everything out, store them in a safe place with sheet protectors so you always know where everything is that you might possibly need. If your organization has an annual audit, you want to hold on to it. You may not need it for a two-pager, but you're going to need it for a 100-page application, right? It's going to be wanted in the appendix. You have to have everything at your fingertips. Dropbox. That's what my advice is to this audience listening because everything can be stored on Dropbox. Yes. Oh, you're smiling. You don't like Dropbox. <laughs> no, we, I use Dropbox. We're big Dropbox. fans with the shrimp tank, all the files, everything. Of course, you get have backups and paper. But I like know, Dropbox. I have so much data, so I hate paper. I am anti-paper, but of course, you need backups with you all the stuff. You need backups. I, I like Dropbox. I like it better than a Google Drive. Yeah. I like it better than uh, I can't figure out this Microsoft whole Microsoft Drive. I hate Microsoft. It. Yeah, I hate it. I can't do <laughs> Anybody that. That's who, the worst. The ki- I think the kids can use it, but we can't for some uh, reason. No, SharePoint, all these things. It's not good. Right. Excel is out. I mean, Google Sheets is awesome. Right. But you see, Dropbox. If you share it with somebody and they decide to delete it or change oh, it, yeah. it's a problem. So Gone. You, right. Yes. So. When I was writing grants, I kept a hard copy of everybody's proposal that was sent in. Yep. And three years later, somebody would come to me and say, Libby, remember we wrote that grant? Well, it's out again. Do you want to do it for us? I said, great. Do you have it? And they always didn't sure. have it. But I had it. I had it. And, of course, look, if I started out writing on, I don't know what we called it. It was this four-and-a-half by five-inch uh, disc Maybe it was called the floppy. I'm not sure. Then, then we went into CDs, right? Yep, and then yep. DVDs, and then it's Dropbox. So I think I know you're talking about the floppy, the long one. You're talking about that little square the one. Little I, square I don't even one. remember what it's called either. Okay. And then, and then you remember those. Then we okay. went to CD. We jumped over that one, whatever they're called. <laughs> so if the technology keeps changing, what doesn't change is your hard copy. And that's why you need to keep something because we don't know. I don't know where, am I gonna, where are we going to be in five years from now if when I started the business, I was using that little um, sure. disc. And then over the years, I, 
I mean, you don't even, when you buy a compu- uh, laptop now, it doesn't even have a, no, a, CD, have a drive CD drive in there, right? I have a few good old mm. ones, but... <laughs> well, Libby, those are some, uh, you know, amazing stories. It's an amazing journey. We're going to take a quick commercial break to hear from our sponsors. Then we're going to jump to our Hot or Not segment of the show. Step into our state-of-the-art innovation lab and create your digital future. Oz uses cutting-edge technology and 22 years of industry knowledge to enhance customer experience through digital innovation in a variety of expertise. Oz is a leading global consulting company whose services and solutions are trusted by startup, midsize, and even Fortune 500 companies. Get to know more about Oz's Salus, a mobile solution bringing us back to max capacity, and their latest solution, Rainmaker, saving insurance companies years of work. To learn more about Oz and their exciting technologies, visit followoz.com. That's F O L L O W O Z.com. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Oz Digital Studio where street smarts and book smarts collide. If this is your first time tuning into this episode, catch all these other episodes up on shrimptankpodcast.com, all the bios of all these amazing entrepreneurs are up on our website and reach out to them on LinkedIn, of course. All of our past guests always say that they're always welcome uh, to provide a couple tips for other folks starting businesses. So definitely reach out on LinkedIn or Instagram. So Libby, on this segment of the show, it's called Hot or Not. We're going to jump into a subject and go into detail why it's hot or not for your business. So we just heard from Oz Digital Consulting. They're big into tech and we just, you know, we're talking about tech a moment ago. So is it hot or not to build an app? For Grant Watch, because apps are very expensive, very hard to maintain. You know, and I know you're an SEO lover, so yeah. they're not great with SEO, but they're great with notifications. I would love an app, but I don't have patience to do something that's going to take a year. If you tell me I'm going to have an app in a month, I'm in. Well, you could build it with 30 developers in a month, but uh-huh. if you if you do the typical five to ten, it's going to take six months to a year, uh-huh. and then there's going to be bugs. Right. right, right. I don't have patience, honestly. Um, but if they want to work with me, I'm, I'm here. It sounds like this is not really the type. I mean, we're, we're going over different sectors of your business. You have four, and we'll touch base on the other two. But it sounds like an app's technically not needed, right? It it's, works very well over a website. I could see right, where but some people would like to do it. I could tell you how it could work. It could okay. work with credits. You could purchase sure. a certain number of credits and then that purchase would let you click into a certain number of grants. So that's how it might work. Okay. And then you'd want to save it into some kind of file so you can have access to it on your desktop. Okay. I mean, I do a lot of work on my iPhone. I could run yes. my entire business myself as a manager through my phone because I can't sit in front of a computer. Uh, yesterday, I was there 15 hours. If my husband didn't bring me food, I would have just been fasting. So uh, I, I run my, I can run my business on my so, iPhone. Uh, so hot or not CRMs then? Because I'm assuming there's a very high-end CRM back in this whole corporation, up, or all the corporations. CRM technology, hot or not? Uh, tell me. Translate. <laughs> Client relationship management software. Uh, so uh, no. you know, I have multiple ones for my business, and I don't know if you're... You know, I, just an, uh, okay, Excel, so, an Excel spreadsheet type, all the all the customers, but you have all this data, you know, coming off the site with all the matches. So I'm assuming there's got to be some back end system well, you know, that's I, tracking that okay, all so and, and I'm not subscriptions. A, I don't like third party stuff because it slows down websites. Yes. So when you bring in a third party uh, something or other into your website, you're now slow, and I want to be fast. Uh, that's we test that speed regularly and we improve. So I built my own CRM in the back of all my websites. Oh, so websites. you have your own custom on. Yeah. I, I yeah. just tell my developer what I need, and then if I need another chart, I tell him what I want on the chart, and he builds it for me. So that's how we work. Yeah, well, you guys have a custom business. So it makes perfect sense. You have a custom CRM, and everything you know, is intertwined from the beginning of the steps. Not you know, So as someone enters your website, and they, they fill out to be a match, well, right. then trickles down to you know, who's matching behind the scenes in your systems. So I totally understand versus building one right from Salesforce. And then you have to manipulate Salesforce technology to then fit your website. Right. So then and you, APIs have, you have a square, a square peg in a round hole. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So we don't do so that. You got, okay. Pretty Libby, cool. what's the hottest sector you've found to work with over the years in your clients from the nonprofits to the government businesses to the small businesses and individuals? 
Well, it's nonprofits. That's that's really our target audience. It's the nonprofits, and this really unlimited number of nonprofits. They're in and out. Um, we have nonprofits that are with us since 2010, and they've subscribed every single year. And then we have people who are with us getting our emails since 2010, and then all of a sudden in 2021. Oh, I've been watching you all this time, but I decided I'm going to subscribe today. And I'm like, we've been sending them every single week a list of grants and something just clicked. Sure. And I love something you said right at the beginning of the show about taking the grant language and making it in simple everyday language so anyone can can get a grant from you all. Can you go into more detail about how you uh, cater to to different types of nonprofits and the, the verbiage or the, the services that you provide or, or maybe the marketing? Well, what we did was we created our um, grant detail page in a way that if you're sitting at a board meeting at a nice big table and they're having their weekly or monthly uh, 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 meeting, you want to be able to print out that one page make a copy, multiple copies, and say, what do you think about this? Should we apply? And so that's what the grant detail page is. It's enough in there for somebody uh, to present it and for the board to make a decision whether they should move forward. Grants for dummies. Is that owned by you by chance? No, because we're not dummies. (laughs) No, but you know, everyone says blank for dummies. You know what I mean. Right. Right. I've thought of writing a book over and over again, and that happens when I hire somebody that takes over a great deal of my work. Is it harder now to bring in a grant writer in-house to a nonprofit or a, another entity, or is it still hot to just freelance this out? It really depends. When I was working in the district office years ago, we were four grant writers and one supervisor. So four grant writers constantly, each, pers- each of us had a few different projects we were working on at the same time. That school district decided that they were going to spend their money that way. That's an investment. You hire some great grant writers, and then the money comes in. And other nonprofit organizations and school districts say, we don't have the money for this. And then they come up with, you know, they hire somebody um, you know, through us or through, you know, just as a consultant. It's a decision of how, what, where you're going to invest your money. If you're employed as a grant writer, how much should you be bringing in relative to your salary? Oh, I don't well, know what, what my multiple was <laughs> at What would you point. expect? What, would, what did you do? What was yours? I, I, you raised, I raised $11 million in two years, and I was not at top salary for the Department of Ed at that point. So Did you get a percentage? Nothing. <laughs> and I tell my I tell everyone that taking a percentage if you're a grant writer is illegal. Mm, and I'll tell you why. Mm. When you write a grant, you create a budget. And in that budget you have to say how every single dollar is going to be spent. So if you write if you think you're going to get money from that grant, a percentage, so then you're taking it away from something else and the funding source never said you could use that money to pay a grant writer. Now, if the nonprofit has general operating expenses and they want to pay you from there, that's different. But they can't pay you – first of all, they can't pay you to write the grant from the grant money. So it can't be if you get it on consignment or whatever uh, – commission. You can't work that way sure. as a grant writer. That's illegal. And you should not get um, any kind of percentage. It's very nice if a, if a company says, listen, you raised us uh, $5 million. We're going to throw a, uh, another 1000 or 2000 your way from our general operating. Whatever it is, that's fine. It's a bonus. It's a bonus, like but it should never be in advance. I only have one more. Go ahead. And is it hot or not to work with your family? Well, <laughs> thinking about this one, you got it, Roland. Thinking about this might have been one. a plead the fifth actually on no, that. No, no. So I'll tell you, um, I have my youngest child is working for the company. She's one of our writers on Grant News, uh, and I have my middle daughter as my um, manager, and my husband now writes some articles that are very interesting. So they all bring different perspectives to the business, and I can bounce things off of them. The, it's hot to have them because they are passionate about the family business. They're loyal to the family business. It's not hot when you want to make a change. 
because now they're so invested in the business, you as the CEO have a few more people to answer to. That's the difference of the family business. But we are way more than a family business because we we actually put food on the table of so many different families sure. working for us. And that is, that would say to, I, I guess I need to say those those people, all the people that work for me, they are my family. I take strong responsibility for them. So before we put up a social media post, I look at it and I say, hmm, you know, are we on the right track? Do we have a finger on the pulse? Is there anything in here that somebody might take the wrong way? Because I, I, well, I say, listen, I could stand up politically and take a side and do this and do that, but I can't because I put food on their, these people's tables and what I do affects them. Great answer. I love it. One more I actually have okay. for you because in 2014, I see you acquired MWBEZone.com. This is for minority and women-owned businesses for grants. How has that sector, how has that gotten hotter since you bought it? Does it stay the same? Why, why did you get into there? I got into there because there were a lot of grants in the business sector, and I wanted to take that on. What happened was we realized there was such an overlap that to have MWBE Zone and Grant Watch, was, we were just duplicating our efforts. And so we moved the business grants into Grant Watch. And we really don't use MWBE Zone anymore. Okay. We have it as well, there's some Instagram. There's still some social media pages around with that, but we don't use it. All the business grants are on Grant Watch. But it was to kind of get that business over into right. Grant Watch. And we we tried it out. We designed the website. We had different colors and all the social media channels. But I changed. Okay. You have to be able to do that. Okay, hot or not, grants when it comes to the state of Florida. Hot. Very hot. Where do they rank out of all the states? Are they in the top top five? Bottom five? Um, I mean, they're hot. They're obviously in the top. <laughs> I can only tell you, based on email addresses, that there's a very strong interest in Florida. I guess my top one is probably California. Then we go to Texas. I think Florida, Michigan but are, are pretty Are you talking close. about just volume of users on your site, or are you talking about actually getting grants, I guess? Well, volume of users. There's no yeah. way for us to know if somebody got a grant on our website unless they tell us. Okay. And so that's what the coffee mug, the latte mugs that you see on the table are all about. Sure. When somebody gets a grant, they get to uh, – we ask them to send us a notification, and oh, we cool. send them a coffee mug, uh, this latte mug, 17-ounce, as a gift – and then they send us back a video that tells us about the grant that they got. And they're so adorable. They're on our testimonial page. Navigation Bar has the testimonial page on it. And you see people, I, every time I get one, I cry. And we just keep adding them to the site because you hear cool. and see what happened. You know, what did we do? How did we make a difference in the world? All the people that work for us. That is awesome. When it comes to SBA loans, you mentioned it earlier, SBA loans hot or not? And what do you guys do with SBA loans? Well, SBA has come out with a, a lot of different programs because of COVID. And there are the original one, the PPP, yeah. was the Payroll Protection Program. And that was, a for, it's, it was called a forgivable loan. And so if you applied, if you were eligible, if you had that dip in your um, revenue, you could apply. And if you use the money correctly, it would be forgiven. If you don't or didn't, you're going to have to pay it back. And so you have Which to be careful. Which we will find out, right? Because right. no one really knows what's going on out there with those. <laughs> right, right. And, uh, you know, you have to be careful. If I leave everybody with one thing, anybody that's going to uh, get uh, be funded, ha have an award, a grant award. When you get that money, open up a separate checking account. Under that, you can nickname your checking accounts. So it, you can use the same EIN number, but nickname it that that's what it's for. Spend every dollar for the program that you have promised to run through that money because you are accountable for every single dollar. And you know, right? So what are you guys, how are you guys involved with SBA loans then? I guess I'm not, I'm not matching it. So when something comes up, not alone. If something yep. comes up from the SBO, SBA, SBA, we will add it to our website. So, oh. yes, you can go to SBA, um, sba.gov, but it's on our website together with all the other grants. So that's just another sure. place that we'll check whether their grants, whether something came available. 
Okay. And what about a podcast? Hot or not for you guys having your own podcast? You guys have so much content out there. And I could sense like a podcast would sound like a great fit. And then you could put all, you know, the recordings and put them into text and put them on your website. It's a possibility. I need a producer. <laughs> oh, Travis Stephanie in the I house. Need, I need a producer. I'd be more than glad to do it because I'm doing these. I just cannot start learning new programs, new software all over again. Well, we got the best producers in town. Well, they're Travis welcome and to. Stephanie are the best. And one day when our, our studio opens up again, uh, when COVID slows down, maybe we could have a conversation about doing your yeah, first love, own I'd podcast and these two right here can be the directors of it. We have all these nonprofits and businesses that won grants that they found on GrantWatch, and I would love to interview them over Zoom and have them tell us what they did, how they applied, and how they're using the funds and they're reporting. You can yeah. learn so much from anybody. I mean, the mug, it just the whole story makes so much sense. That's right. why I'm like podcasting. It yeah. just seems like it would all come, you know, to life even further, you know, and. You're crying now. Imagine after a, a 40 minute podcast show, right? Well, we're going to take a quick commercial break to hear from our sponsors when you get back. We're going to jump into our fu future focus segments. Are you having a hard time finding good people? The key to successfully finding top quality candidates is to expand your candidate pool. That's exactly what a virtual hiring event powered by Premier Virtual will do for you. Over 2,500 virtual hiring events later, more than 25,000 companies have connected with over 250,000 job seekers. These events are much more than a resume. Virtual hiring events give your recruiters the ability to meet and pre-screen candidates and decide if they're a good fit. The efficiency and effectiveness of virtual hiring events has reduced time to hire from an average of 30 days to just over seven days. Premier Virtual has received a top rating for ease of use and customer support on software review sites like G2 and Captera. We've also been selected a top 100 company to work for in Florida by Florida Trend Magazine. Meet our veteran-owned Delray Beach-based company by visiting premiervirtual.com and schedule a free demo to see how you could host your first virtual hiring event within 24 hours. premiervirtual.com, it's time to take your hiring virtual. Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Shrimp Tank and virtual hiring and hiring in general we're going to jump into. So every business has hiring issues these days, right? You see right. the numbers. Everyone's trying to pay more, get better talent, you know, but they don't seem to exist, you know, supply and demand, of course. So what is the hottest way that you have found to hire for, for your organization? Well, I will publicize the job okay. using some of the software that's available, but... I have to use my gut when I do hiring. And the first thing is the voice on the phone. Okay. Um, they have to be lively. They have to be out there. They have to have passion for their work. They have to love the nonprofit industry in order to work for me. They have to be the person that wants to fix the world. Yeah. Okay. But not somebody that stands with their politics on their shirt. That's not for me. Okay, they have to be there for everyone, and then I'm st I start to get interested. Uh, I can't stand when I get a resume and there's misspellings on the resume. I mean, Not for your industry. So you're hiring who? People who are doing customer service, or are they doing marketing? What are they doing? Them? So I believe that in my office, you have to be able to do everything. So you are not just a marketer. You must do customer service. What we do is we take our uh, eight-hour day and we divide it into um, 16 half hours and blocks of time. And if you work for me, you have to make eight of them green, which means you are... Which is Starbucks, right? No. Oh. <laughs> which means that you, during those eight... You have to be available to answer phones, chats, and emails. You have to take customer service calls. During your entire uh, 16 time slots, you have an expectations chart that you need to fill in. Every, empl every employee has, we have this large chart that's on, I use, that I use Google on, and I have in column A everything that, every, every single thing that has to be accomplished during the day by everyone. And it's all gray. Everybody has a gray cell. But if it's your job, it's pink. That's just the way I have it on my particular sheet. You can use any color you want. Uh, so now you have to fill it in. So if you have to share social media 
If Nikita puts out the social media and you, Sue, have to share it, you have to write that you shared it today and which one you shared. And if you have to create a content video on Tuesday, it better be ready on Tuesday. If you have to write a content article on Monday, it has to be ready on Monday. Everybody knows what they have to do. So I have, you ask me who I hire, you have to have a skill. So either you're my copy editor and you've worked for a newspaper at some point and now you're working for me because I don't want to have to read every article. I mean, I do, but I don't want to have to read it before it's published. You have to be an, or you have to be an artist to do my beautiful graphics or you have to be somebody who knows social media very well and, and can do great social media. So you have to have your skill, but you also have to be able to handle customer service. So cross-training and customer service is Everybody. pretty key. And everybody, because you have to be at a level and you have to be able to write in a chat something that really helps the grant seeker. And you only know that because you're working all around the website. At what point did you, f I assume, formalize your HR? Like when in the evolution of the business did you do that? The entrepreneurs don't do that when they start the business. They do it as they grow. Right. When did you do that? I think, well, my expectation chart is probably, was probably created with going remote because we were in office. I had computers and desks and chairs. I, I tell you, I still have computer chairs in my house. <laughs> that we just donated two of them because, like, what no are we going to do with them? one even takes them. i got to get rid of some of the chairs in my house. I can't get rid of them. Oh, we bring them to, what, Faith Farm or something? Yeah, sure. they give you I, I nice need, I need one. I need one. Uh -huh. yeah. You see, you just... I'm happy to provide. I'll come pick it up. <laughs> right, right. So that... Um, I do this cross-training because I really feel that you want the person that knows the website well to help you, right? You don't have, and I hate when I call up a company and they tell me that due to COVID, people can't answer the phone. I mean, come on, answer the phone from your house. Like, why are people using this as an excuse? I don't allow my phone to stay ringing between 9 a.m., and 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, my phone is answered, my chats are answered, my emails are answered. After that, if you ch start to chat and nobody's there, we're going to get an email with the chat. It's going to be responded to in the morning. Occasionally, after 6, my husband will tell you that I am taking calls, if, you know, in between doing something else sometimes because I'm just in the mood to reach out and talk to my people. And that's how I know when I need to make an improvement. So talk about company culture because everything you just discussed, you know, uh, you know, people are not staying with your company unless you're a family, right? And I could sense you talked about that earlier that you're doing something behind the scenes, you know, to uh, you know, to keep everybody around, right? You you have all these slots, everyone's working, everyone's doing all these different topics, but but what keeps them there? First, if you work for me, I care about you. I really do care about you. I, you know, that's the way it is. I, we have one of our um, employees, his daughter's getting married on Friday. You know, like, I know that. I know that somebody's sure. brother was in the hospital because he, you know, there was an explosion, something. I know what's going on in your life. I am willing to listen. And it takes time. It really does. And I tell my staff, listen, if it seems like I'm callous at any point, it's because I'm under stress. And then I will remember that you told me, and I will give you empathy a little bit later. Please yeah. forgive me. Because that happens sometimes. You know, you have to help three clients at the same time, and then you know your staff needs you. But I try to really make time for my staff and talk to them and know what's going on. And how do you get them to care? Because often you always see this all online and on podcasts that, you know, the people that are working with you never care much, as much as you do about your baby, right? And you see that, like, you're willing to take calls after 6 p.m., but a lot of times they're checking out right at 6 on the dot. But when people really have great culture, then you find that they do care past 6 p.m. So kind of, how do you get them to care? Okay, so you have to know something, Jason. It's not always the culture of the organization. Sometimes there's a quality of people. Yes. That, and you have to, when you hire... You have to listen. If people have boundaries, I can't have them work for me. And it's not that I'm going to call you up at 9 o'clock at night and ask you to do work. Of course. Okay? I'll tell you to close your Skype when you, walk, when you, lock, when you clock out, yeah. close your phone, clo close the office phone, close the Skype. I may text you on Skype in the middle of the night because I'm telling you what I want you to do tomorrow morning. Okay? I don't expect you to do it now. 
I will text you on your phone, on your personal cell phone, if there's something that's wrong that you did that cannot wait, right? If you really messed up the website. But otherwise, but I don't want people who have boundaries because, yes, there's sometimes when you need somebody to stay till 6.30 instead of 6. And I'll say, listen, Will, come in tomorrow at, at 9.30 because I know you work late. And I, and I love that because at the end of the day, we all have cell phones and it drives me nuts. Like everyone acts like, like this isn't by their hip, right? They're on this thing all day long. And what's awesome about your organization is you could text them and just, just check in and get an answer back. Right. Where a lot of other organizations don't have that. And, and same thing with our organization, like Travis, Stephanie in the room, like I could text them at nine o'clock and they're not looking at it as like, oh, the boss is testing me. You know, oh, you're making do. At least I don't think so. Travis is grinning. <laughs> Stephanie's grinning at me right now. Uh-huh. But they'll text me back, and and they'll just check in. And that's I think sometimes that's all. Right when we're they respond, for. if if I write something, it turns out I wrote it at at nine p.m. They shouldn't really be working now, and I sent them a message, and they respond. I know that they're really thinking about my business. So they come in to work, and they say, you know, Libby, I was thinking about this last night. And I think we should do it this and this way. I want to hear what they have to say because they took my business home with them. Uh, earlier today, I spoke with someone, and she asked me my biggest problem with the, you know in owning a business. Yeah. And I said it's finding balance. And you know what she told me? She said she calls it harmony. Yeah. Because finding balance has so much guilt in there. But harmony sounds so nice, you know. I'm sure. going to harmonize my business with my life. <laughs> so Okay, well, we're going to take a quick commercial break here from our sponsors. Then we're going to get to our final segment of the show called Plead the Fit. Are you ready to make your indelible impression? Duray & Company is an award-winning, full-service, public relations and marketing agency with offices in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and Aspen, Colorado. With practice areas in business, real estate, cannabis, nonprofit, legal, and lifestyle, Duray & Company is fully equipped to help clients reach their goals with strategies that are on point. Whether it's public relations, social media, digital marketing, content development, or other services, Duray & Company delivers results for business owners that address their business goals and reach their targeted audience. To learn more about Duray & Company and our services, visit DurayAndCompany.com, D-U-R-E-E-A-N-D-C-O-M-P-A-N-Y.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Shrimp Tank. I'm going to let Roland Kidwell kick off the Plead the Fix segment. So on this segment, Libby, it's just about not saying those words, Plead the Fifth. If you do, you got to say it only once, and if you say it twice... You have to buy food for uh, Dr. Kidwell for the next year. That's the new deal here on the, the shrimp tent that we started doing as of last week. So, Dr. Roland Kidwell, kick things off. He's I'm getting worried. Out. He doesn't like these rules. <laughs> well, I've got a few questions, but let me just ask you this. What is the toughest thing about running this business? Uh, toughest thing? I guess it's really trying to be there for everyone. You know, just... It's my clients, it's my staff, it's my family, it's taking me, <laughs> giving everybody a little piece of Libby, and then finding what Libby needs. And this is your husband here? This is my husband. And he my works wife. in the business with you? He, he writes. He keeps him busy, out okay. of trouble. <laughs> well, I'll steal Jason's question. Okay. What is your biggest pet peeve with your husband? That is working my question. The I was going right for it. <laughs> My biggest pet peeve. Um, and he has a microphone, so he can answer back. I have told him how to forward his article to a copy editor many times, <laughs> and it's always Livy coming here. I forgot how to do it. You know, mm-hmm. how to attach the article from a Word doc into the email, uh, things like that. Uh, when I really i am focused on something and I really feel feel that I'm, you know, I, I can stop, but I have to stop. Because our offices, are, we have two different rooms in the house where we each work. Well, I got a good service for you. It's called Just Google It. So what you do is you go on your iPhone, you search a site, Just Google It, and when, when he asks that question, you don't go in and give him the answer. 
you send them a text message and you're showing them literally going to Google <laughs> and you're and you're searching how to attach a document into blank. Uh, Would he's, you like to? Uh, he's getting there. That's what he's I, getting that's there. What I do with my he's team. doing it. Would you yeah. like to answer the question? <laughs> Address that. He's coming. Here he goes. Yes. Oh, you he really goes. wanted to get him involved Jake, here, right? He's smiling. He's grinning. <laughs> I said I forgot for a moment, and then I remembered. <laughs> right. There's there's two things that happen when you get to be my age. You get hard of hearing, and I forgot the second one. Oh, I totally <laughs> empathize with you. I got to tell my that. wife that one. That's a, that's a good trick. I'm mm-hmm. hard of hearing, and then mm-hmm. I don't get in trouble as much on my uh, right. spouse's end. Anyway, let's jump into um, something illegal, right? So you said earlier in the episode that grant writers cannot take a percentage of the grant. So tell us a story where someone did, and it was illegal, and they got in some trouble. Um, I don't have that story. What I have is a story where they are supposed to have the client sign the contract and pay on the website. Instead, they had a conversation with the client, sent a contract to the client, which they're not supposed to do, Sure. and the client paid them. So whose fault is it? We write it that the client is not to pay the grant writer. The client is like, but the grant writer asked me to cash app them the money. And that happened. Uh, And how did I find out? Because we have, again deliverables and we're looking how come a deliverable isn't paid the work should have been done or how come this grant writer has so many jobs that says that the client wasn't interested anymore what's going on here and so I have to I call the client and say gee how is it working with so and so oh it's great you know that I spoke to them on Friday and I'm like what so they were just bypassing you they bypassed me and so what did you do uh, I asked the client to send me proof of payment so I would know. I called the client, the grant writer. This particular grant writer said, no, no, I'm doing it pro bono, blah, 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 blah. And then I get a letter from the client that says, yeah, they're doing it pro, pro bono. It was almost like the grant writer wrote it. This happened This happened yesterday, right? Yesterday I was oh, living. Oh, this is recent. Not off the press. Yes, huh? this was, this well, was just yesterday. a foolish move because they're going to kick off your website. Ah, right? wait, wait. She's not on my website anymore. That's the thing. She, sure. she, and she says she's not in the business anymore and the whole thing. So I, I write back to this person who happens to be a pastor, and I write back, I don't understand how you condone this behavior. Something here is wrong. I know you told me that you paid her this amount of money. I know you told me that they sent you a client, uh, contract and everything. And then, I, you know, and then I write to the grant writer. I say, I don't believe this. I know what happened. You have today to come clean. After today, no more. Today you come clean and you be honest with me and tell me the truth. She calls me up and she says, well, the nonprofit didn't have the money, so I was working with this pastor and I'm working directly with him. I go, you found him through the website. You should not be working off yeah. the website. I, mean, I said, this is what you're going to do. You're going to go on the site. You're going to finish your, setting up your contract that you gave him. You're going to have the pastor sign the contract. Then you're going to tell... Fill out, I'll see all the deliverables. I'll know how much is due our company. I will upload that. You'll, you're going to send me that money. I'm, and you're going to upload all the work that you did. So we have the files. And then everything is going to be clean as though nothing ever happened. And guess what? She says, I don't have any files. I said, what do you mean you don't have any files? You took $1,500. Where's the work? Where's the work? Sure. Well, he never gave me this paper and that paper, so it's going on. I said, this is going on since February. We're in August. You mean you never wrote a single thing for him? No. Then all of a sudden she says to me, okay, I'll tell you what. I'm going to send you the $1,500, and you can give it back to the pastor. I said, that's great. She goes, but I don't have the money till September 17th, oh. and I'll have to do it in three parts. I said, great. Send me an email that says that. I now have that email. We'll see what happens. Sure. But this is, she never did the work. And this so is, this is the most egregious example of a grant writer doing something. Going rogue. Or is, or is this something that happens uh, 
It's not a regular occurrence. It's not a, okay. it's, it, uh, it's very it, rare. They burn their bridge. I mean, it, it makes no sense. It if that's like, how you're getting customers and clients, why would you burn the bridge? So I guess bridge? we could, the easy no plead the fifth is for you to identify these people, but we'll just do oh, it. Oh, no, I can't one. do that, but I'm not allowed. I'm probably not allowed because I gave her so a chance. So are you pleading the fifth? Is, did Roland make you? <laughs> no, that's too easy. That's no, too, easy. too easy. But the, the point is that here what happened is, and I tell my clients, don't pay the grant writer off the site because then you took us out of the mix to make sure your work was done. Had this, she, had the pastor have paid her on the site in February, we would have known by now. We would have known by now sure. that the work wasn't done yeah. and she would have had to do the work. But what do you do, though, in a case like that if they get paid and don't do the work? Have you had that happen? Well, they, right now the way it is, if you pay on the site, you're only getting that small retainer, oh, right. 80, and you're getting 20, yeah. piece by right. piece. You're right. not getting 1500 in one shot. Right. It right. works out. And it just it blows my mind because I work with honest people. That is the way we are. You have to have values to work for me. And when this happens, I'm so shocked because I don't live in that kind of human nature. That's not my space. Well, Libby, we've heard so many successful tips uh, tips on how to r run a successful business today. I want you to touch on something for 30 seconds here because next, uh, next week is the 20-year anniversary of 9-11. Uh, and you actually led a team on Ground Zero 20 years ago. So could you just touch briefly on, on what you were able to do and, and what that's meant to you? What happened was I was running for office oh. for city council in Staten Island. 9-11 was my primary and they stopped the voting in the middle, of course, and everybody, I was actually in Brooklyn at the time, my district was Staten Island, a piece of Brooklyn that I was running for, and we were told by a police officer, you need to get home because of what happened. We didn't know, we were out on the street, and uh, we got quickly over the Verrazano Bridge back to Staten Island, and I went back to my school, because I took off time from teaching, and I helped out with the parent, uh, with the children, because parents weren't picking up children, kids were scared. We could see the smoke from my school, and then my campaign office was kind of like, "What do we do now?" Because we didn't know when the election would happen and what's going to happen, and the, the church bells were ringing every day in Staten Island because, uh, you know, people they knew people died. Yeah, so a big firefighter community in Staten Island, of course. Right, and, and all, all the public service yeah. workers were there. So we called all the restaurants in Staten Island. And we had trays of food and medical supplies, six minivans filled. We went over on the, on the Staten Island Ferry to Ground Zero. September 13th, we were there. At the bottom of the Bucket Brigade, they set up tables for us, and we were feeding all the workers. And when, it, when something started falling, there was like an alarm like in a mine, and you, had to, you just grabbed somebody and ran, and you had to get out of there. And from there, um, President Bush was coming in one day, and we, had to, we couldn't go back to ground zero. So they put us at the staging area, and we were feeding the workers before they started working or coming back. And from there, we went to Fresh Kills, and we were up there feeding everybody. So that's what we did with 9-11. We were there. Wow. Well, 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 that wasn't really a plead the fifth question. That was a great answer. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, well, that was we the will, truth. I <laughs> think we will, we will end the episode oh, I, based I have on... One oh, more. he's I still have, going. He's still well, going. I happen, he no, never lets anyone get out of this my, segment my, without saying those my words. My question sort of was answered when you said Staten Island. Mm -hmm. But really it was, how did you as a Democrat lose to a Republican in a city council race in New York City? Ooh, Staten Island, Staten Island, Staten Island was Republican. <laughs> yeah. uh, how I lost was the following. It was nine, so we ran 9-11 was, was the primary. 9-25 was the primary that really counted. I won the Democratic primary. And then we ran, and from 9-25 to Election Day, uh, you know, Staten Island was in mourning, really, seriously in yeah. mourning. People went with the incumbent. That's really what happened over there. But I did get a nice chunk of change. I had 35% of the vote, and I was a new, relative newcomer to politics. So, Did you ever want to go back into politics after that? No, because after the election, sir, some people that I knew because I was running and I had met along the way, they were running in other areas or they were incumbents in other areas, they ended up in jail for different things and I, you know nothing to do with me but I was like so shocked by it that I was really I knew these people and I'm saying I have a family what do I need this for sure. you know so that's why I just didn't run again
And you joined the Sunshine State a few years Florida. later, right? <laughs> right. Well, Libby, thank you for coming out to the Shrimp Tank today. This has been an amazing episode. I've, I know I've learned a ton throughout this journey with you today. So if anyone wants to get in touch with your organization, what's the websites? Can they reach out to you? What's the best way? Is it LinkedIn? Uh, grantwatch.com. They can call me. The number's on the website. They can write to me at support at grantwatch.com. Uh, grantwriterteam.com and there's one that we never spoke about and that's youhelp.com which is our version of crowdfunding mm-hmm. for nonprofits. Interesting. Absolutely interesting. We'll have to do a follow-up episode to get even further into okay. some of these other <laughs> platforms that you're up to, of course. Well, thanks again for coming out to the Shrimp Tank. Yeah, we'll be back next Thursday at 4 p.m. Take care, everybody. I'm not a